Previously, in X-Men, the team of Colossus, Storm, Nightcrawler, Wolverine, Banshee, and Cyclops has returned from helping Phoenix save the universe and has earned some much-deserved rest and relaxation. With the expertise of Dr. Moira McTaggart and Professor Xavier, what will this group of mutants do when the phone line is out? Keeping in mind that they built and regularly repair the sci-fi danger room, stratojet, and other high-tech devices. Find out in this week's episode where we put the spotlight on the all-new, all-different X-Men 110 and ask the question, Berg? 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 It makes no sense. I'm Jason Lapidus. I'm Chris Sandigan. And we are Group of Seven Comics, and we are breaking it down X-Men 110 today on our YouTube channel live stream. Please, if you're enjoying this and you want to support us, click subscribe to the channel, click like, share with other people who you think might be so inclined to enjoy a breakdown of some X-Men comics. We are reading through the second Genesis, the classic run of X-Men comics, starting with Giant Size X-Men number one and working our way through. And now we're into the John Byrne era. We've just read X-Men 109, which is the tightest drawn or tightest illustrated issue of X-Men so far. It's a pleasure to read. It feels like it's an almost modern issue. And then we read 110, and it is... You know, <laughs> the series has just hit a high point. It was building for, for months and months. A climax with kind of like the end of season one of a TV show with mm. Phoenix stepping up and saving the universe with the help of the X-Men. And then we get one issue where they're back at home and it puts Wolverine in the forefront, which is awesome. Introduces uh, character, a, a character which will eventually be the center point of Alpha Flight. So it's Weapon Alpha, soon to be called Vindicator, then called Guardian and flips back to Vindicator a couple times. Um, and then we get this next issue. And I love to read the issue without knowing its historical context in this case, because you just get to have the full impact of being hit in the head with what feels like a bad comic by comparison. Yeah. 109. I don't know. What was, what was your uh, initial take there? Holy heck, what is going on? You know, it reminded me, uh, it, it brought back memories of that issue. You know, when it's halfway between when the, the Star Jammers cut. Yeah. And then we're, we're all propelling forward together. And then it cuts to this other other event that happens for an entire issue, yeah. which we then looked at the history of why it was happening. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I, I think my, fir- my first instinct is, holy heck, my, sen- my second instinct is, uh, oh, something's happening behind the scenes. <laughs> sure. We- We've been down this path before. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, so this one is gets credited to Chris Claremont as the author. Yeah. And guest artist Tony Dunazinga. Uh, am I not pronouncing it right? It's Dunazinga. It, yeah. It goes Dizaniga against my information of how to read it, right? Yeah. Dunazinga. And uh, it also, there's a thanks here to Dave Crockham for a welcome art assist. Yeah. So, Dizaniga does pencils and inks. He's just guest artist overall. Um, I have some insight as to what Cochran did, uh, but we'll save it maybe for as we and get. And the cover is Cochran. The cover is Dave. cover is definitely Dave Cochran, for sure. We see yeah. his hand there, and we can see Terry Austin's work. Uh, where we can, we got lot, lots of pen, especially like around, it sounds so silly to say, but like I see his hand on Cyclops's peck shadow and on Cyclops's hand and all the, all the fine details. I can see per- Terry Austin's like fi- finer line, which mm-hmm. was sort of new to the series and is one of like the most iconic ink lines from, from my youth for sure. So I'm a huge fan. This issue has some firsts in it, some meaningful firsts for X. Men or X fans, X Men lovers or X fans, whatever you want to say. Does it really? It yeah, it has some neat first in it. Okay. Um, I mean, yeah. I, I definitely noted a number of things. I wonder if those are the firsts. Some things. That's often yeah. great. You know, to be very specific about it, there are some things that I noted down. Okay, I'm I'm looking forward to it. Um, yeah. Okay, we we just dive right into this. I think so. Talk yeah. about uh, this this amazing cover. And how we get the name is Warhawk Mutants. 
and I'm going to slay you with your own danger room. <laughs> How ironic. Yeah, and like you said to me before we came on uh, the live stream, it looks like Colossus in, <laughs> on the monitor. Uh, Wear, wearing a varsity sweater. It does. It, it's not a great look. It really for the isn't. Villain, uh, who we get to know as Warhawk because he's so unimportant that they better tell us his name right away. Otherwise, we'll forget even that he was there or why. Oh my God, the amount of times where we are introduced to a character in this book and it's like, well, tell me your name. Oh, I'll yeah. tell you my name. It's this. <laughs> yeah, it, it's not very strong. <laughs> it's not very strong. And so this, this is, but you know what? Like, this is one of the things that I'm enjoying so far about the Claremont written run that we are dive, we've dove, dive, dived into is that, you know, like not everything's strong and that's actually okay. Like I'm, yeah. I, I, it's, it almost, it almost, uh, uh, you know, it, it kind of brings it down a level to just kind of <laughs> every, every person, every creator is fallible. Oh, and totally. so they have these excellent arcs and they have these like, what is even going on that month? They, they also all have their strong suits as creators as, right. you know, in, the, in what they can create. And they all have their deficiencies. Yeah. And when you get a team of people who balance each other's deficiencies with their strengths, then you get some real magic happening. And this is not the case right now. Mm -hmm. Right? Oh, that's right. Biden is giving, giving a State of the Union address right now. So uh, we have Trevor from One Six Shooter saying, "Hey guys, shifting between you and the State of the Union." <laughs> well, I, I don't know if we'll be able to compete. We'll try. No, this, it's it. Listen, it's a, a very historic time, and I would not begrudge you, Trevor, for uh, listening to your president uh, in this big historic time. So <laughs> you can catch us on the rerun. Don't worry about it. This is going to be on YouTube uh, as long as there is a YouTube, I guess. Uh, so feel free to do what you need to do, but I do appreciate you giving us a slight edge. Although it makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, it's neat to see a cover where all the characters on it are using their powers. It's always a challenge to do. Yep. And notice again, who is absent? Who's not there? Cockrum does not like putting Wolverine on his covers. Is that fair to say? Uh, well, it appears to be the. I mean, so was one hundred nine was the cover by Byrne or was it by Cockrum? It was a cover by Cockrum with Austin inking. Okay, and it was the first time that we saw the probably the largest character on the cover, or the one closest to the camera, if if you want to think about it that way, is Wolverine. Yeah, yeah. but he's getting punched, so he's, he's not. Yeah, I was going to say he he <laughs> he's not not in any kind of heroic. Pose. No, he's not looking good on that cover. He's taking no, he's a not. bit of a whooping. Um, but he still is featured on the cover. Yes. 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 All right. Do you want to dive in and keep going a little? It. Let's do it. So here is the first big first. Do you know what this is? So is it the first because they're playing baseball and Wolverine's still in uniform? <laughs> That's not That's I'm not a nice baller, by the way. Um, well, but, yeah, I guess, but he's kind of all. Yeah, I guess you're right. Nightcrawler wears this, I think, all the time. Right. When they, when they meet him in Giant Size X Men, and he's running away from the Bavarian, the mob in Bavaria. Mob. Yeah, he's wearing this. This is like yeah. his. I don't know how we're supposed to interpret Nightcrawler's outfit. It's definitely not a superhero costume, considering he wasn't a superhero. Is it meant to be as part of the circus? It maybe it's his circus outfit. Uh, but he obviously really likes it because he wears it all the time. Right. And Wolverine obviously likes his costume because he wears it all the time. He is wearing this costume for some reason. And I don't have a good explanation for it. It just adds to the ridiculousness of this issue. Um, for a little bit of context about Dinazinga, he, D sorry, Dizaniga, he is a Filipino born artist who is the first in a wave of, of talent coming from the Philippines to New York to work in mainstream comics with Marvel and DC. So he's a, like a trailblazer in that sense. Okay. And uh, he brings a different aesthetic to his work. And I'm going to criticize openly just from a readability sense and some, some orientation, not, mm -hmm. not on any other, you know, like obviously my, my thinking with, with artists, usually when I see them in print, 
working for Marvel or DC is I know they actually are really good, talented people. They don't always have the opportunity to show their great talents in certain issues because of things like deadlines and uh, interest sure. or certain support that they get. Um, just so to talk about this, you know, we're looking at a baseball game. Let's just assume that this is not a standard, like regulation size baseball diamond. Okay. Okay. What position is Wolverine playing? First base. Arguably, he's playing first base, right? We've got, I guess, Moira at second base. Moira's at second. We've got Jean Grey shortstop. She's covering third. short and third. Fair enough. Okay. Nightcrawler's pitching, Colossus batting, Banshee is catching. No one in the outfield. <laughs> no, with the strongest member of the team, even without their powers. Up to bat. Uh, up to bat. No one's in the outfield, which is fine. Also, Professor X is doing his best Monty Burns. I pucked, uh, when I touched my bu belt buckle, not once, not twice, but thrice. He's also on the verge of... <laughs> is this Banshee. a game or a debate? <laughs> He's giving Banshee a little goose there. He's like, whoop. Um, <laughs> He's also goosing the Banshee. I can <laughs> I can just see this going really badly, like Cyclops getting his glasses knocked off. Like you, there, you don't stand it, there. It does look like Cyclops and Storm are and Banshee is way too close to that bat. <laughs> yes, there are some issues here with, with sure. perspective or you know the depth. So the, what are the firsts? This is the first time the X Men play baseball in an X Men comic. Do they play baseball a lot in the X Men? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. This is like it's it's a part of the tradition. Okay. The. And and you know who's the best pitcher is like, yeah. There's there's talk. This it seems to be whenever there's like an annual or an issue where they are able to sort of like relax and stuff. They have a baseball game. It's sort of and, and of course the more characters you get, the more fun it is because their personalities come out through how they play baseball. I wonder if uh, Claremont's American, right? I know Burns from the UK and Canada, but Claremont is actually British than American. Okay. I was going to say, I wonder if one of the two are, are is you know big baseball fan. I'm not sure what brought this about, but if you want yeah. to read, there is some there is some pretty bonkers dialoguing here. If you the, want to. There is, and do you know what it actually? What's so great about it? So so much bonkers dialogue. When when Wolverine is saying swing bada swing bada, it just makes me think of Ferris Bueller's Day Off. It did not. And Cameron being swing bada at Wrigley Field. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. A wing. <laughs> I love he, he's like, come on, Elf. Yeah. Fastball. The Ruskies an easy out. I don't think so, firstly. Yeah. Uh, you know, with his heightened sense. Wolverine, of... shut up, Wolverine. <laughs> <laughs> like he calls him easy out. Peter's been up twice already, and both times he's hit a home run. Right. How do you figure that guy's an easy out? <sighs> I mean he's just trash talking, I guess. It's but, trash talking. Uh, also, the way that it looks like Nightcrawler's arm is winding up, is, is winding up. It actually looks like he's going to pitch underhand. As it to does. Him. It does. This this issue is soft. not really good for for uh, all those kinds of details. Um, Nightcrawler's tail goes in front of the <laughs> the, the word bubble. The tail on the word balloon there, and the word, yeah, like, the word balloon. Yeah, Just some bad work. That's just <laughs> sloppy. Anyway, but also the X sanction. It's not like. Egg sanction is a word. Like it's, you know, maybe like the X, the X should stand for EX in that sense, in the way that sure. that's written. And there is no sure. word that that is a word for. I agree. It is, it is very weird. <laughs> yeah, I would, it borders on shitty. <laughs> <laughs> borders on quite terrible. You want to flip? Yeah, let's do it. And then this swing uh, is the reverse. <laughs> It is, it, it just is not, it's not good. This is not good. I love this. Nightcrawler's pitch is sheer perfection, low and inside, just skirting the strike zone and fast as a bullet. Okay, if it's sheer perfection, he wouldn't hit it. Yeah. Simple as that. You're like, are we talking about like the best pitching in Major League Baseball? <laughs> a little hyperbolic here, Claremont, a little bit. Oh. And then I don't know where the ball's, okay, so the ball's going, I guess, over shortstop. Yeah, I think it's on its way out of the park. And Jean, and Jean uses her power. Oh, no, not again. Have to use my telekinetic powers to snag the ball. And while it's happening, she apologizes. Sorry, Peter. Last time you nearly broke a windshield, remember? 
okay, I get, we don't know whose car, but what? Sure. Right, like, oh no, a car. The windshield of a light plane flying at a thousand so, feet. What? Right. Is that guy dead then? <laughs> the <laughs> pilot. <laughs> so without his powers, he hit it high enough to hit an airplane? Yeah. Because in the Soviet Union, that's how they play baseball. So now, here we go. Next panel we get. <laughs> Wolverine says, quit babbling, genie. Throw the flaming ball. House rules say I got to tag Petey to make the out. So Gene again has pulled the ball down from shortstop. Yeah. She throws to Wolverine. Yeah. Peter is running from Gene to Wolverine. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. If we house rule Wolverine says he hits first. the ball. Yeah. If Wolverine's on first, that doesn't make sense. Peter's running around the wrong way. Yeah. Peter is very much turned ass backwards. If we think Wolverine's on second, Peter is running the wrong way. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because he's right third. Yeah. Yeah. If he's on third. This is right. Yeah. That's that's all good. So ball comes through. We can see here now on the next panel. I'm afraid Tavarish <laughs> it will not be that easy. Um, as Peter's coming, he's barely made any headway from yeah. being up to bat to this yeah. moment. And so the ball has flown in the air. Peter has watched it. And Wolverine has popped, popped his, claws. his claws. I I don't know if this is done Marvel style. Yeah. So this issue is Marvel style, and that means Claremont gives a, a, a an outline. Tony goes and draws it, and then Claremont fills in the words. Does Claremont tell him, "Hey, dude, make him pop his claws as Claus mm -hmm. is running from home to first? Uh, <sighs> Someone's I, yeah. Someone's got to make that Marvel Legend hand piece. Oh my God! The baseball glove with the baseball claws. glove with the claws coming in. Oh my God! Wow. Now, the other just quick thing. Um, Wolverine does say house rules say I got to tag PD to make the out. Yeah. That would mean that they either that is not it's not first base because you just have to tag the base first. You don't have to tag the player. But when he says house rules, it means that they're, they've changed the rules to make it more fun for what they're doing. That's right. So, like a pop it, fly is just not an out, right? It is first base, and you just got to tag the runner. Yeah. Um. It. It's, you know, tough talk, tough. Sorry, tough talk, bub. <laughs> but if you want to play reference to your funeral, I'm gonna kill you for this baseball game. Yep. I'm gonna 100%. kill you dead. And Colossus turns on his powers. Yep. In a really uninteresting way, his clothes are a mess. His uniform is underneath his yeah, clothes. He kind of hulks out here. Yes, and then, and then, I, I don't even know. Like, I don't know where to begin. Perhaps you know. Perhaps Wolverine's going to work. Perhaps not. And then something weird happens. Colossus's leg is in the air. Yeah. I, I don't understand the panel. Yeah, and I don't it, think anyone does. It's why they've written and wonders what happened. And Claremont has to go and explain. For a moment, there's only a stunned silence as everyone stares at the dust cloud thrown up by the impact and wonders what's happened. It's it's so unclear what's happening. And then it continues with a slight breeze gesture from Storm. Mm -hmm. or Sorry, with a slight gesture from Storm, a breeze whips up from nowhere to blow the dust away and, and reveal. You were saying, Wolverine. Get off of me, you big lummox. So something happened. Colossus, I guess, kicked. He just he came in so much, like with so much dust that Wolverine. I, I don't know. There. Yeah. He's just sitting on Wolverine, and Wolverine can't stab him, but he wants to, or he doesn't want to. And then uh, Colossus continues, like, no, my friend. <laughs> not until you sheath your claws. This is a game, not war. Game war, what's the difference? <laughs> all right, already you made your point. I'm backing off. It it's just insane. Yeah, 100%. And then, and then something else weird kind and of. And then something else weird happens. So the the players decide to get up because there's there hasn't been an out, but they're going to take a break. Right. And for now, Petey boy. But now and forever and next time, I'll kill you dead. Yeah. Like he's, 
He's got a grudge against Colossus for putting his powers on coming into first when Wolverine was the one who popped his claws. It's so backwards. Yep. Come on, Wolverine, we're taking a break. What do you want from me, Bubba? A cheer? You can... Uh, you take a break, Summers. I ain't tired. And then here we go. Oh, something's happening. Yeah. Anyone ever tell you you've got one heck of a chip on your shoulder, old buddy? Oh, no, I'm in the friend zone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not my face twice. Get out, get out of the yeah. You can't be a loner all your life, Wolvie. I like being a loner, Genie. No <laughs> hassles, no complications, no grief. I lived my whole life not knowing what love is and not caring either till I met you. Whew. When the did lyrics from the song. Has he said anything about Jean Grey this entire run? I wrote that down. Out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. Wolverine is now in love with Jean Grey. Yeah, so he he does get... There's the scene where when she comes back to Earth as Phoenix, he visits in the hospital with flowers, but it's, it's, oh, right. not, this, but it's not this level. Right? You know, maybe it's a bit... Maybe he's, maybe he's a bit of a crush. Maybe. Right, but oh, it was there. You're absolutely right. But this is like, uh, I love you, Jean Grey. <laughs> this is now animated series. Yeah, it's not. There is now the full on love triangle where he's like, "Yeah, I've never known what it was love like to love anybody yeah. until you." And he's until his in, baseball game until you. And the, yeah, and he's in the old buddy zone. So he is in the buddy zone. And then Moira tells them, "Oh, the phone company should be here. It's almost four o'clock. You know, because our phone is down. Because uh, with all these brilliant people here, we don't have one person who can repair a phone." Even I blame her. Isn't she meant to be managing that house? That's true, and she, the text she has in Muir Isle, but <laughs> the Professor Xavier, has. like the anyway, anyway. again the Stratojet, everything else. Um, Banshee's in love with her. Everyone else is having pop and soda. Lemonade. It looks to me like Colossus is about to drink a ketchup bottle. <laughs> it's a bottle of hot sauce. <laughs> and Professor Xavier is just left off to the side. <laughs> Withered old man just yep. left. This. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. is bonkers. Storm's got a soda. It's good. Yeah, Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew. Look at that. Yeah. That's awesome. A Parker Stevenson T-shirt. <laughs> Remember when he was on Baywatch? Oh yeah. Let me get a nice VW kind of bus pulling sure. up or something with the the phone logo. And some narration talking about a utility van that pulls up, and then some shadowy guy with the ding dong. Um, <laughs> great, and he's really shady looking. I actually really like those three panels, truthfully. I think they're the three best, like, s- sequence of panels where right. I understand the space and what's going on and the relationship between the characters. It that's well done, right? Um, yeah, but it, you know, she sees like his face. Good lord, his face. Something wrong, ma'am? Um, no, I was... No, you're just freakishly <laughs> freakish. And then it, can, she continues to talk about you know going to the phone junction, but she says, like, she says, pull yourself together, woman. You've seen plastic surgery before. The poor man. He must get this reaction a lot. So he has a shockingly, pa- uh, like, uh, surgically altered face. Yep. Um, Hideous. But when we see him, it's... That's not plastic surgery. <laughs> like, if that's her first thought, she should be thinking, "Oh, this I okay. I, I live with superpowered beings. Yeah, I've met an alien. Yeah, I've met a herald of Galactus. I've you know Eric the Red. All these figures, and her first thought when she sees a person with, I guess, a metal face. It's a really bad plastic surgery job. Is that it's plastic surgery? Yeah. Anyway, he assaults her, puts her to sleep with his uh, drug gun. His dart drug gun, yep. There's a dart that fired? Uh, well, later on, there are darts. Right. So, so he there's a, a foot sound, which is like the blow dart kind of. Yep. But we don't obviously see where it is on her person when it hits her. Um, the panel at the bottom corner on page six, the bottom right corner, Mm-hmm. Her forearm is really long. <laughs> really 
really oh my god long. she's become mr fantastic's power set it's really long that's very long yes and then uh our our mystery villain um he talks about a master some so he's working for somebody mm-hmm. and he decides to take his clothes off as one does or his, his disguise he takes his disguise takes, okay fine takes his disguise off you win this battle and steps into the house refers to the x-men as kids which i'm going to bring up a little later yeah and they bring it up again and he's just monologuing like this to me and you know 1978 or whatever this is word balloon uh this is thought balloon or thought bubble or thought cloud territory and he's just talking out loud you know what i mean and the x-men have cameras everywhere so they can go back and watch the footage and hear everything he's saying um yeah it, i find this just really odd that he's just talking 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 as he's going around yeah and he gets to watch the baseball game yeah against the wolverines now up to bat yeah and jean's pitching yeah she looks which really is neat. odd because they're on the same team only moments ago yes it doesn't matter Maybe it's individuals. Like you just kind of cycle it is. everyone rotating yeah. positions. But you know how Scott's behind him too. It's like all three are in the love triangle. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. It's really, really odd. So he's going to realign some of the systems, and then he has a, a mental attack from mental attack. His master. His master. Yep. And I don't quite understand what this next panel is. This hazy, smoky. Is it the visage? Uh, it- of himself or of his master? See, I took that to be him. Right, because the color scheme is him. There's a color scheme, yeah. But you see, it's in cloud form. So it's supposed to be like his memory or the past or a thought. Yeah. Um, why is he thinking of his own face? Maybe he's just like super egotistical. Either way, I'm just saying it's unclear. It is unclear. I don't know what that's about. Also, the next panel, when he, you know, kind of, he then curses this master and, like, openly says, I'll make you pay. I don't know. It seems that maybe that servitude isn't quite what. True. And this guy can read his mind. Right. Right. <laughs> oh, he'll, he'll never see this coming. Oh, crap. <laughs> That's right. It really is bonkers. Oh, okay. Let's keep going. And then on the next page, on page eight, if that that's what's. Oh, no, it's going to be after. Ooh. Satisfy your meat, meat tooth? tooth. Is that what it said? Yeah. Ooh, I want to know what a meat tooth is. Oh, as opposed to a sweet tooth. Get your meat tooth on. Ugh. Ugh. This panel, uh, top left corner, yep. is some ugly panel. Wolverine's face. <laughs> <laughs> There's an yeah, it doesn't work. It's just nope. the drawing doesn't work. Nope. Um, Colossus and Cyclops are the same size. Yep. I find that he consistently underdraws Colossus's size. Right. And also Storm is the same height, by the way. Mm-hmm. And um, and they keep and they do it in the panel in the fourth panel too. Jean just uses her, you know, telekinesis to, to push <laughs> push the professor's wheelchair like a, yeah. And so, I mean, either she's like super lazy, like I got this, or like normally they he would just be wheeled or he'd do it himself. Yeah, it's very strange. It, it is. Um, Scott notices that Wolverine's asked Jean for company, yeah, which is again adding to this. Uh, well, that's a first, yeah. This, this panel with Scott in the top right corner on page 10 also makes me think that. There's not enough room for the all the words. Like you need to draw Scott smaller, right? He just had to cover up so much of the artwork there with these uh, these word balloons, which mm. is too bad. Uh, and then the next pit panel, we've got all the X Men about to go into the danger room, and again, Wolverine is the same size as Nightcrawler and almost almost the same size as Colossus, yeah. who is the same size as Banshee. I mean. Yeah, the scale of these characters is really, really whack. Mm-hmm. And uh, Gene's going on and talking about um, not feeling, you know, her, her usual self, not, you know, being used to fighting anymore. Um, 
talking about the change from going to being from being regular old Jean Grey to being Phoenix, and the two most powerful telepaths on the on the planet do not sense the presence of a of a third person. I was going to mention that, yeah. Like for them to get sn uh, snuck up on, um, I find it inconsistent, but that's okay. I'm willing to go with it. They're distracted by something. Um, so what's going on with the dude's like outfit? It's like knives that are, are in a V towards his belt buckle. Okay. This is the one character that Denizinga didn't Dizaniga. Dizaniga. Dizaniga gets to create. Okay. And it is bad looking. No it's not an image to this guy. He's got his skull belt. Skull he's got belt. the knives or whatever. Going like he, he looks like skull. the fan. He looks like someone really like the Phantom, because right. the Phantom had a skull belt, right? Sure, sure, yes. Yeah, yeah. It was a really uninspired, and then the collar on his sweater. It's, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a really uninspired look. Um, I don't want to tell you. Anyway, he dart guns the professor and <laughs> dart guns, dart guns everybody, and they all they go out. Um, and he needs two shots. He just stopped a global or the cosmic cataclysm, and she can't stop a dark gun. Yeah, I don't know why he's hiding on the second floor because that's where they went, right? Yeah, that's where they went. Yeah, they went up to the second floor, I guess, because we can see that they're going. She's up pushing the professor back to bed. It, yeah, so he's hiding there anyway. The X Men are now all in uniform, and they're about to go in the danger room. And uh, yeah, Scott senses the connection between him and Gene and uh, the professor, and they're in pain. And the door closes behind them, which says exit on it. And then, yeah. you know, I guess shit hits the fan, and the X Men are forced to participate against their will in a danger room that is trying to kill them. Yes. And, and, this, and this is where, you know, where Colossus, you know, starts to, I'll just bash our way out of here. And I, I was amazed that he, he couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> was... You tell him that he's going to, and then, of course, he's unable to. Yeah. Um, the power of Colossus, yes. Okay, there you go, buddy. There are so many words in this. Look, like, look at this two-page spread. There are so much dialogue, and I really do think, like you were saying before, it's mm -hmm. because it's unclear that Claremont feels the need to, A, he is overriding anyway. Mm -hmm. He's it's just so much pointless. Like if the cartooning was clear, you wouldn't need to have it all, but he also does. He doesn't ever choose the shortest way to explain something. No, no brevity is not his no thing. And I think with a great penciler doing clear layouts, you know, he probably would feel less pressure to have to overwrite. Um, but with, a cartoonist or, you know, in this case, whatever, a storyteller, a visual storyteller that doesn't do things as clearly as Byrne and Cockrum. Um, it's just not working mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. So they're trapped. Um, lots of panels. Like, look at the, these pages are just covered in words and, and really, really too many panels on this, uh, on page 11 here. It's really yeah. heavy. Yeah, it's too bad. Okay. So we move into... This is a pretty rad ad, though. Ooh. Right? Beauty ad. Yeah, that's a great X-Wing. Yep. Anyway, we can we can linger on that page. It's quite nice. <laughs> yeah. All right. And here we design. go. It really is a great design. Yeah. Um, what the flamin'? Yeah, that mask is looking. The, the nose is a little small. It reminds me more like of his whiskers mask. Yeah, in some of its uh, the way it sits on the nose. And Banshee's just action packed there. Look at him, just standing. Just and I guess there. Colossus. Sorry, Cyclops is on the ground. Well, yeah, I guess because it's still recovering from his telepathic shock, maybe. Yeah. Really okay. Beautiful stuff. Then anyway, X Men scatter. Scatter. Danger room. It's going after us. Everyone, run away. And they all know where to run for some reason. Um, lasers, full power. Yep. Nightcrawler gets hit in the gut with a pile driver erupting out of the yeah. wall. 
Storm saves him at the last second. Uses her powers a little bit. They get caught in a net. Yep, giant net. Ooh, my goodness. And then Wolverine quickly gets Colossus to fastball special. Way to go, big fella. And he's uh, got only one chance here, so he yep, cuts them loose. Nice awkward pose for that Wolverine yeah, slot. His, his butt's in the air for sure. A little bit of, uh, I don't know, it's like right out of like the cartoon shorts from SNL, the ambiguous, ambiguously gay dude. Oh. <laughs> Where just, uh, Ace and Gary? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that pose is, this is just it's a little buddy. <laughs> Um, he rescues them. Many thanks, Wolverine. Good. And just and he calls her a frail again. Yeah. What the? Like, I think I wrote down, like, what the hell is he? Like, how, the language they give Wolverine. Yeah. I'd have done the same for any frail. What do you, what, what the, what, do you, what the hell? <laughs> it's, it's so bad. Then here's a great moment. Hey. Razor Wings headed for Psyche, and he ain't spotted him. If I just butt out, presto, I got a clear track with Genie. Trouble is, back shooting ain't my style. When Summers and me finally have it out, it's going to be face to face. Down, dummy. <laughs> so he's thinking, I can just let Cyclops die here, and then <laughs> Gene will be mine. That's right, because wow. it's not her choice, it's his. Right. Oh. oh, well, he says a clear track too, meaning that there's no right. in his way to getting to her. Uh, it, it, there isn't really the possession thing, but I think it's implied in that, in that yeah. spirit of that anyway. But the idea that Wolverine's like, yeah, I could just let her boyfriend die. I could do that, but I won't do it. No. And so he saved Cyclops' life. I owe you one. Um, I find there's this one thing with the panels here. Yeah. Which I find really odd. Um, in the third and fourth panel, where they meet at the bottom, mm -hmm. like, with the tear underneath, hey, does it? This is really bad looking. <laughs> this irks me. It's sort of like uh, it just it feels so unnecessary. Like fix it. Do do one of the panels differently. Fix this problem. It doesn't draw right. one thing a tiny bit smaller and then move that line down or move it up. Whatever you're gonna do, but that's right. ugly. Ugly. Yeah. yeah. Ton of words. Oh my goodness. Just... Next one, if Next you want one. to. And they finally get a plan. They're gonna go on the offensive here. Yeah. Send Nightcrawler outside. Like it seems like at this point, like you and I were talking about before in the previous episode, they don't really make great use of Nightcrawler's powers yet. No. And this is definitely an example of where they find like, oh, after you know, a couple of, of our lives have been in danger, why don't we just teleport outside of the room? Mm -hmm. Like this is X Men one hundred and one here. I don't mean by mm -hmm. issue number; I mean university course or high school course. It's like the first class is your power is you are a teleporter. Yeah, That's your primary function: take a person or all of us out of this room. We've also seen in one other issue, um, probably was it maybe 108 or 107, where Nightcrawler teleports Lalandra. Oh, it says here, doesn't it? Yeah. It 107. Does. 107. Um, so he hasn't had a lot of experience teleporting other people. So it's neat to see he has to flex a little bit to get that done. And it really is taxing. And he passes out teleporting Wolverine out of the, out of, uh, the danger room. Yeah. Anyway, but they do it. And it's a good plan. And he bamps, and they talk about the smell of the brimstone, which Claremont loves to remind us every time. Every issue. Smells like rotten eggs. Yep. And, uh, yeah, Wolverine's passed out, too, um, which is odd, but, yeah. And uh, Storm gets contained in a box. And but but not before that she has time to philosophically think about her situation. How ironic, in a way. Yes. <laughs> to survive a war on a world millions of light years from Earth, only to be like, Storm, get your head out of the clouds that you make. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, it's like It's ironic. Yeah, fascinating. One of the other pieces here, like, you know how the 
Um, the assembly line to make this issue is not working in, in smooth unison. Yeah. And another a great example of this is we have this panel on the bottom of page 17 there where we see Storm in the box. It's like a full a full figure of her. Yeah. And there's so much, in again, so much verbiage from Claremont that they have to, the letter has to break the word afraid into two pieces. Right. This is... Six letter word. I mean... <laughs> I've, I don't have a lot of experience lettering comics, you know, uh, sure. up, to, up to eight issues now so far, nine issues of lettering comics, and I'm getting better at it. That's fine. And I realize I have the good fortune of being able to do things digitally, but it is, I would never, I, I don't even like breaking apart big words anyway. I try and, you know, make space for it and make the lines work, make the, there to be flow. But this is so bad. It's just, it, it's so much more difficult to read by doing it this way. I'm not afraid. Like she's not like as if the word afraid was a thing and she's not one of them. I'm not afraid. <laughs> not afraid. Anyway, just, it's ugly. It's just, it, is. it feels like not just the B team, but a C team is making this comic. Yeah. Anyway. <sighs> she's a total claustrophobe lad. Banshee says about Storm. And they work to her. Of course, you get her out here before she cracks. Yeah. Oh, that's so good of you. Thank you. I don't mean you. I meant Banshee. Obviously. Yeah, this is the danger room. All right. Yay. So here's something. In Please. terms of the X Men um, the tropes of the series, and you've mentioned already the baseball piece. Um, the Danger Room turning on the X Men yes. is it a, is it a constant uh, threat? Uh, because I mean I know it's it's put to really amazing use in the um, first first arc of the Whedon run of Astonishing X Men, where sure. I think Danger Room becomes Danger, which is actually an AI, right? And that's kind of a neat. I always I thought that was a cool thing, but again, it feels like well, it feels like they often find themselves in the Danger Room. And, you know, things have gone awry and therefore they have to kind of fight beyond what the room was set up to do. Yeah. Is this the first time in, in, the, in the Claremont run that we've come across this? This idea, I think that the danger room is actually not a training space, but it has suddenly has, has a run amok. It happens so often that I... They should decommission the danger room. <laughs> it's a... Uh... Yeah, it happens so often, and it's almost like, what excuse can you make for them to have to fight the danger room? Right. So we've talked about Pride of the X Men, the pilot for the yes. animated series, that you know from about eighty nine ish, and it is. Uh, I always thought it was a, a really great. I thought the animation was superior to the series, um, but it's a uh, a touchstone in in you know X Men media. Um, available on YouTube if you want to watch it. Pride of the X Men. Yeah, Pride is spelled with a Y for Kitty Pride. Right. And um, in it, she gets spooked and phases through the computers, which short circuits the computers. Of course. Which escalates the trouble of the danger room. So they have to do it there as well. Right. And it is yes, it is an ongoing trope. I feel like I've I've seen so many times where they've had to fight the danger room that it. Uh, I I'm. I just kind of expect it if they're going to be in the danger room. I I'm I also believe that they even had to do it on Spider-Man and his amazing friends. There's an episode where um, Firestar. I, I don't even know why they go back, <laughs> but <laughs> Iceman, Firestar, and Spider-Man go back and visit the X-Men, and Thunderbird is on the team. Oh, okay. Kitty Pride is on the team as Sprite. Okay. Uh, Colossus is there, and uh, they go back and they, they fight a person who takes over the house, which becomes like an extension of the danger room. Of course. So there are traps throughout the whole house. They have to find their way there. Anyway, so it is it is definitely an X trope. X trope. Yeah. The house, in some capacity, uh, goes against them. Yeah. Goes against them. Yeah. Yeah. X mail. Do you want to do the X mail now or at the end? Let's come back to it if you don't mind. What do you think? We can do it later. Yeah. Okay. Superheroes assemble 
including Howard the Duck. Yes, he was a big sell. Yeah, there's Conan right there, too, you're saying. Yeah, yeah. He was a huge seller. He had two series running at one point. Yeah, you were saying. And they're paying licensing to get Conan, so they weren't earning as much off Conan as they would have if it was a right. in-house character, but it was selling really, really well. Yeah. Just, yeah, so here we go. Yeah. So we'll they fight a robot that they had in the danger room or sort of that they fought like way called back. Colosso. Colosso back in X-Men like issue 20 maybe a long time ago. Colosso was a character. And then they brought in Colossus. Yeah, well, yeah. Obviously Colosso was a reference to the word Colossus. Sure. But they're it's two different generations of X-Men creators. They just wow. Yeah. Wow. And yep. now the Wolverine gets uh, wakes want, up and you don't want to talk about the flypaper. The flypaper, sure, go for it. Gross. Moving on. It is gross. <laughs> and then Wolverine, you know, finally slashes the controls. Yeah. And this is all we've been waiting. I mean, this really should have taken two seconds, right? Two like, seconds. They're trapped in the room. Wolverine out. Slash claws done. And he goes up to fight now against the villain, who yeah. punches him in the back of the head. With his super extendo arm? Yeah, the proportions are creative. They're they're creative. Yeah. That's okay. He almost looks like a proto Admiral Thrawn. Yeah, okay. You I'll know that. But it's possible surgery, isn't it? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Which apparently extends to his hands and, and half thrawn. sleeve. Half sleeve. Yeah, a three quarter sleeve, a sweater with his cool skull belt. I like the belt. The belt, the belt is cool. I'm into the belt, and I think that collar reminds me of a, a naval. Um, hey, I, from a guy right. who, who draws characters in turtlenecks, right? I'm not yeah. going to complain about it. Yeah, I, I dig it too. Yeah. And then this panel in the bottom left corner of Wolverine landing, it also reads like Wolverine shrinking. Yeah. Right. He's using comic book shorthand for shrinking. Odd. Odd. Anyway. Odd. And so now, when, and this is this is when he he says, you know, uh, I like knowing who I'm up against. So you got to tell me your backstory, villain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm Warhawk, little man. But, I'm the ultimate soldier who gets beat. I'm the ultimate soldier. First of all, I love how it's like your claws are no match against my dark gun, which is right. Hard. Secondly, he's like. Wolverine says, I recognize that design. It's a flechette pistol. <laughs> Firing rocket powered darts. What an odd. <laughs> you know, again, explaining to the reader yep. what he's holding. Yeah. I recognize that. Because yeah. when I'm not using my claws, I'm shooting dart guns. <laughs> That's that happens to be my favorite model. Yeah. Dear Lord. I have Warhawk, Ultimate Soldier, terrible. Just okay. Uh, turn belly fat into a rock head, lean stomach. Okay. Nice. You know what? The ads are still going on today, and still going on like they were back in 1978. Totally. Here we go. No kidding. Well, I'll tell you my name. <laughs> we're gonna have a little name off, partner. <laughs> Wolverine takes a swing, catches him. Mid torso, like rib cage. Yeah. And the guy's made of steel. Yeah. Or something, S something organic that, metal, tougher well, than steel and impervious to harm. Right. Because adamantium should cut through that like butter. Well, we don't, this guy's just, for some reason, just a steel guy. Yeah. He's been just colored blue and that's going to read as steel. Tougher than steel. So he, you know, he says he's going to crush Wolverine because Wolverine can annoy him. That's all he can do. Uh -huh. Wolverine's like, I'm not going to quit. Let's let's keep going. And then uh, he does take a swing at the guy again, and the guy grabs Wolverine by his leg, throws him against the door. Wolverine says, "Yow, yow!" <laughs> and the door burned him because the X Men are coming through the other side. Yeah, and. I think we can assume that maybe Cyclops was shooting while Colossus was punching. Yeah. And that's why it's hot. But why would it be hot? 
I'm not sure. I think that's why the color is the color like that magenta. Yeah. It suggests the Cyclops was using his optic blast, but again, unclear. And then the X-Men come out the door. Uh, yeah. With Colossus being so small. Mm -hmm. And um, what's this guy's name again? Warhawk. Warhawk. Like his pose is like uh, almost like he just got, I don't know, like he was caught doing something. Yeah. As opposed to in the middle of a fight. Caught looking on something on the computer he shouldn't be looking on. Yeah. Yeah. There's no way that this guy's made of metal or any organic steel. No. Peachy keen, honey bunch. Wolverine says. Dude here calls Dude me here. The He's the one who's trying to kill us. Do us a favor, bub. Say yes. This is one of the, the few artists who also would draw Wolverine's cloth with little hook at the end. Little hooks at the end, yeah. Good for back scratches. Meow. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> so then Warhawk goes to uh, use a bomb, a gas bomb, and realizes it is gone. It's and gone. Nightcrawler stole it. Who knows when? Which is another good use of his abilities, his agility, his camouflage, his stealth. Mm -hmm. But it, nothing was going on there. Like it just, that's fine. You know what would have been good if they had done that something about it during the baseball game to foreshadow, right? Have there be a, like a, a play at uh, one of the bases where all of a sudden, uh, you know, the, who, where's where's the ball? He, you know, like oh, I understand. The, the play would be he's first base. There's a runner on first. Yeah, he beats off, and Nightcrawler pretends to throw back to the pitch. Yeah, he fakes he it, and yeah, exactly. it. and he's like they had the ball the whole time. Exactly. Uh, you need this ball? Yeah. That would have been if this was a, a, a longer comic or just if they devoted more time to... To, to, to think about it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so Nightcrawler has the guy's bomb. The guy's got nothing. And all of a sudden, Nightcrawler punches him in the face. And where Wolverine's punch doesn't really hurt him. Right. Nightcrawler's punch knocks him right out off his feet. And then Colossus comes in with the big one and uh, they take him away. Ouch. And then they call the cops. And they call the cops. <laughs> and it's like wrapped up, like, you know, two punches, boom, boom. And he is done. And Xavier and Jean Grey recover. They've got, you know, a smoking police officer guy. Um, what do they call that guy? Uh, his captain. Yeah. He's a captain, first of all, which. <laughs> it's... He's having a smoke. Captain Delaney. Captain Delaney. No uh, Irish stereotype. We're good. And yeah. um, I love this. He he's like so. Uh, how do you how do your kids in your school? Uh, sorry, how do your how do your school kids do it? You know, yeah. how do you fight this. This guy's an unstoppable soldier. Ultimate soldier. There is a federal flyer on this guy. Like, you know, Interpol is aware of this as as a possible threat. How do your school kids do this? And I love th these are school kids. Look, look at the way they're dressed. Look at the way right. they look. They're the least kid-like school kids I've Wolverine ever seen. Wolverine is the hairiest fourteen-year-old you've ever met. I mean, Cy Cyclops is drawn as if he's thirty-five to forty and eight um, feet tall. <laughs> yeah, I don't mind if they're if they are kids to a degree. Well, but none of them are even drawn remotely close enough to be called kids. In you know, and this, this goes back to that whole, like even the way that this team is gathered and they, they double down on it occasionally. And they keep talking about like that school for gifted youngsters. It's like, they're not kids. Yeah. No, not at all. No. And in this scene, Nightcrawler with all the cops there, Nightcrawler is not using his image inducer. His right. image inducer, pardon me. He's just, you like freaks it. are okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's and, and the fact that he's the, the professor is like, I can't keep lying to the cops about what happens here. Yeah, that is funny. That doesn't read <laughs> well in the 21st century. <laughs> what? So the team goes back to the house, they're talking, and um, I'm sure I'm forgetting something, but I'm oh you, no, you're not forgetting anything. <laughs> there's so much dialogue on this page. This is that Gene wants to rejoin the team. Yeah. That's all I wanted to say. Jean is said outright she wants to rejoin the team. Yeah, you got and yourself I, another X Men if you'll have me. And then Scott in that second panel, 
There's more to this than meets the eye. Something in Jean's voice sounds wrong, almost scared. Blasted woman! I want to help you, but why won't you talk to me anymore? Well, maybe because you yell at her and call her woman. <laughs> like, I love Scott has, still has no idea. No, no he, idea. He's, awful. he's learned a damn thing. And um, then Wolverine pops his claws again in the second last panel for some reason? Yeah. And then they, yeah. They We're do not it. exactly pushovers, you know, prof. And they do a little cheer. And then they do like, yay, X-Men. They do yay, X-Men with his claws out. With his claws. There should be everyone flinching. Like, that mm. is the weird, like, okay, so this is, you know, we were talking earlier, I'm like, this is bonkers. And like, yeah. they, so not only do we have this kind of weak storyline and, and, and then, you know, hey, professor, any idea where Warhawk came from? No idea whatsoever, Scott. <laughs> like, he's just a correct character we made up for this issue. Yeah. It's like, and then and then Wolverine and the team all hip hip hooray. They do. It reminds me of that scene at the end of uh, the Simpsons episode where Homer goes to college. Oh and, yeah. You know, party down. Down. And then Homer is yeah, and he jumps, and it's like goes into Louie Louie while he's yeah. partway through the jump. Uh, this uh, issue that's... could have used Sir Winks a lot. Tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> and the crusty old Dean. <laughs> I love that also. The editor, Archie Goodwin, yeah, is aware that this issue is so weak. He basically is saying, "Don't worry, everybody. Byrne and Austin are coming back." Yeah, this is this is not indicative of what we sell, what we make. Byrne and Austin are coming back next issue. Yeah, I find that really really funny. Do you want to check so, out that? Uh, yeah. So, what page was it on? Here, hold on, here. You found it? No, I didn't. I don't know. There it is. X Mail. <laughs> Apologia. Are you able to read that? Sure. Please do. Okay. As many of you have no doubt noticed, this is the second fill-in issue of the X-Men to be done in recent months. Unlike the previous fill-in, X-Men 106, which you and I have already talked about. Mm -hmm. However, this one is intentional. It was commissioned over a year ago and was intended to buy then X-Men artist Dave Cochran an extra two months to get the book on and hopefully ahead of schedule. As such, it was plotted in sequence with the other issues, indeed before Dave left the book and John Byrne took over. The job had been slated to be the X-Men's first adventure following the conclusion of the Star Jammer's Empire plotline. More on them later in this letter. Unfortunately, Dave decided to leave X-Men, and this is where things started to get a little screwy. <laughs> you see, we had, we, had we run this fill-in as originally scheduled as X-Men 109, People could have quite justifiably wondered if we'd suddenly gotten ourselves hooked on a game of musical artists. But with Bob Brown filling being followed by Dave's last issue, 107, and then the first Burn Terry Austin issue, then all of a sudden another filling. So to give the readers a chance to get used to Burn's style, we bumped this filling as far as we could, which for production reasons turned out to be the only one issue and the rest is history. Who says the age of Marvel Madness is all but over? Sometimes a body gets the feeling it's only just begun. A couple of final notes. First, the art. When we are planning to fill in, a number of names are tossed up as potential artists. The lucky devil who got the assignment to cheers of approval all around was trailblazing Tony DeZuniga, one of the finest artists in the business today. We had high hopes when we sent out the plot, and the result even amazed us. And finally, while this issue is a fill-in, the next issue is already penciled, and by the time you read this, will probably be completed. And with any luck and a discreet nod from the ninth floor powers that be, X-Men will probably be monthly. In the meantime, though, we're running out of letter co letter call. I don't know. I don't know what that means. I don't know. There you go. So that's like all the insight, I guess, one one needs. Yeah, I guess so. Um crazy. So yes, this is um, what do they call it? An, an inventory issue, right? They, okay. They commission these issues every once in a while. They pay the people for it as they hand in their page. Yeah. They're getting paid for it. So they've paid for the issue. They they can't really drag it out because the way the story is going, it will no longer fit in continuity if they wait any longer. Yeah. And they couldn't do it an issue before because they'd have four issues in a row with four different artists. Yeah. I get it. It had to go now. Um, unfortunate they had to go at all. Yeah, but it happened. Um, yeah, that's that's basically all the background that there is. I mean, and you you called it a what did you call it? Kind inventory of issue? issue. In inventory, oh, you have the inventory. You have it already in the can. Yeah, yeah, and that that to me, 
it speaks volumes because I noticed. Um, so as you know, I've been collecting the some of the '80s Daredevil, and uh, there are a few early there are a few issues in that run where it's like you're heading somewhere, and then there's a, just this issue. And you're like, what the heck was that? And then it picks it back up again. Yeah. So I, I imagine it's probably the same phenomenon to some degree. Yeah, it's it's what a good production team would do. Like you, you make sure that you're not going to have a problem with um, getting books out every month because books are coming out. You have to, otherwise you're becoming totally. money. So you, uh, yeah, you stock up these inventory issues, and then as um, we get more and more artists who start to go in Terry Austin's and Burns' detailed, tight rendered style, it takes them longer. And then there's a third thing that happens here. When you get a new editor-in-chief into the early 80s, Jim Shooter starts to implement a royalty system. Right. Finally. So creators are getting paid more money if their book sells better. Pretty good sentence. Right. And so they, they were starting to realize that, oh, if I take two months to draw an issue, but I make... Five hundred thousand dollars on one issue. It's better than pumping one out every month and getting right. just paid five thousand dollars, right, or whatever ten thousand dollars. So um, we start to see more and more artists lean toward taking more and more time, and um, eventually you get things like incredibly, oh, well, guys like Frank Quietly, whose work is very detailed and very very. Um, very well thought out work. He really takes his time and he does mm-hmm. not rush. He chooses perfection over over expediency. And then you get John Romita Jr., who's from the generation before um, that incentive program, and he's influenced by his dad, obviously, and he values expediency over perfection. And it, it's such an interesting conversation. So I jokingly call it the, the Romita quietly spectrum. Because you, you fall somewhere between those two guys. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is just that example of like we're meeting deadlines and um, we've got this issue already paid for. So let's put it out now or never. And yeah, unfortunately, it really does. It kills the buzz. So, my friend, I didn't say at the beginning where I was reading it because I didn't want to spoil. But I read it in this because there is no issue of Classic X Men with this comic. I was going to ask you. And I made sure I would tell you. Yeah, there is no issue with that. No, they did not include it in the run of Classic X-Men. So we have issue uh, 16 um, was the last one. And then the next one is going to be issue 17, of course, which is the next story that we want to read from. Issue 111. Burn and Burn in Austin. And it is, yeah, 111. So it, it's, it's fascinating. They just leave this out because it just has no impact. It doesn't, uh, although it has the first baseball and there's another step towards the love triangle. Right. And, you know, the danger room trope. It just doesn't have a bearing on continuity. And isn't the other issue, which is the fill-in issue with Bob Brown, also left out of the classic X-Men run? Yes. So the classic X-Men run is is intentionally like that beautiful Cockrum into Burn run. Yep. And yep. Yeah, and that's that's just what it is. So Cockrum did help. With some of yeah. the model. Um, it said that uh, he came back and saw some of uh, Denaziga's pencils and made a few modifications to some of the costumes to get them back on model. But not nearly enough. No. No. No, no, no. no. Yeah, there you go. Wow. A stinker of an issue. I understand why Marvel would never throw a guy under the bus at the time. Um but like I said, I, I think you know he's a more talented creator, more talented artist than this issue gives him credit. It just really doesn't suit him. Yeah, I bet you he can draw the heck out of something else, um, especially when it's you know in his wheelhouse. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, this one really wasn't for him at was all. Not. Was not. No, I don't know. Look, look at this. Oh, Prowler. Yeah, Amazon had him cheap. It's like, oh, that's really cool. Nice pinless look. too. He's got no pins in the legs or elbows. Oh, nice. Really good looking figure. I'm really happy. Where's that from? Which line? Uh, Marvel Legends. That's Legends, eh? He did a wave of 
into the Spider Verse figures. Right, right, right. Was it was it Gwen Stacy and Spider Ham? I need that one still. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I need that yeah, one. Spider-Man. Like it's it's expensive too now because the mm-hmm. Spider Ham figure is like people want that. It's a it's a nice desk like prop. Yeah, you know, like people yeah. want that around. And then from a build a figure point of view, the wave it's Stilt Man. Stilt Man. Yeah, and that's the body of Stilt Man. Is that? Oh, is the buck? Yeah, kind so of. I can't assemble all the pieces I have until I got. I got to get that one. So, if you ever come across a, uh, will a they call her Spider Verse Gwen uh, Stacy is the name yeah. of the figure. Spider Verse Gwen Stacy. Well, um, listen, I am I am heading down to the states in a few weeks. If there's anything that you are particularly looking for, and I will be hitting up targets and all those kinds of excellent stores. So let me know. Yeah, that's that's what I'm looking for for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll leave it at that. But yeah, uh, send me a list. <laughs> no. Just <laughs> if you see that, that'd be awesome. Um, next issue, X Men 111. It it's like like another one that's in, close to my heart. Have you read ahead yet? No, I don't read ahead. I just I, every week, just I'm surprised every week. Um, yep, Burn and Austin are back, and it really shows. What else can I tell you? And it kind of just like the, the momentum is really like it, cool. It's going somewhere. Um, for for a, we're going on a good adventure now. I think like I'm awesome. These would be the issues that I would read over and over and over. We're, yeah. we're, we're into that spot now. So I'm, I'm excited. We're going to have some guests coming up in future weeks. I'm looking forward to that too. Uh, we can, we can all just call it. I think we can call it. Minutes. I think we can call it. Go watch Biden's speech. Yeah. And then come back and, and, and folks out there re rewatch this one because this issue deserves your attention for sure. Um, and also a uh, shout out, to our brand new subscriber on YouTube, Anthony Spataro. I hope I'm saying that name right, but uh, new subscriber, we appreciate your uh, your 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 subscription. Thank you very much. Shout out, hope, Anthony. Hope you enjoyed issue 110. I I hope that's who I think it is. Oh, Spataro is, or I, I don't I don't know Anthony's last name. I just okay. know uh, a comic book store okay. guy. Name Anthony that uh, I've talked about this podcast or this show with since before we started that I you know, wanted to do oh, this. Cool. He's a good X Men reader and a, a, a good ally. And he, he chose a great issue to come on board with. <laughs> hopefully, I'll see him tomorrow or the next day. Um, hopefully, also I get to see Batman or the Batman this week. Mm-hmm. But if we, if we we can end it there, and I can just talk to you uh, offline yeah. for a minute or two. But there That's you cool. go. Uh, please click like and subscribe to the channel. We could really use the support. We really want to hit 100 subscribers as soon as we can. Once we hit 100, some things get unlocked. We can add a little bit more interaction and, um, yeah, get a little momentum going, which would be really wonderful. As well, please share with any comic book fans you know that would be interested in hanging out on a live stream. Um, we, we love when we have some participation in the chat. This was not one of those weeks, and that's totally okay. Uh, you're always good company, Chris. So Thanks, I appreciate that. You can follow both Chris and I on social media at Cooper seven comics, which is where uh, we post the comics that we make from our series. You can go to our website, uh, www group of seven comics, the number seven dot CA. Um, of course I'm Jason Lapidus art. That's my handle on Instagram. And uh, you can, that's what the best place to follow me. What about you, man? Yeah. Chris Sanigan. Um, I'm on, I'm on the Instagrams and the Twitters and uh, that's, that's the easiest way to find me as well. Yeah. And uh, at group of seven comics, at group of seven at, comics, at everything, and uh, at all, all the platforms that we need to be on or think we need to be on or are just on. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> all right. Cheers. Have a good one. Yeah. You too. Uh, nice to see you as always. And as always. I'll talk to you in five minutes. Maybe. <laughs>